Well, our next guest is Ms. Um, Pascale Gelli from France, from APCDP France, member of the CDPO and uh, Group Data Protection Officer Schneider Electric. Her presentation is about building a DPO network. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much to you and to Marius and to ICDP, ACPD, sorry. It sounds very close to the name of our own association in France. Uh, for the invitation. Um, really, uh, I'm impressed that you are able to organize a two-day event uh, and uh, gather the attention of, uh, of people. Uh, it's a uh, it's great resource uh, at IFCDP, which is the French Association of Privacy Professionals. We just closed our event on the 26th of uh, January. It is our annual event. And uh, we did it remotely, as you do, because we had no uh, other choice. And uh, I understand what challenge it is. So uh, congratulations again. Um, well, um, first of all, I have to explain to you why I'm wearing sunglasses so that you're not too surprised. I'm not trying to conceal my identity. Also, I'm not thinking that you are doing facial recognition. I'm sure you're not doing that because you are a serious association who preserves the rights and freedoms of individuals. It's just because I have very sensitive eyes, so I don't stand the light of computers. It hurts me very much. So now you've seen my face and I hide my eyes again in order to, to protect them. Now, um, so just to tell you what I'm going to explain to you today, uh, as my colleagues did, I, I will give you uh, an idea of how we build this DPO network in France. And then I will uh, give you also a little bit of flavor of what is uh, enforcement uh, in France or what it has been uh, last year, so that you see what are the hot topics. So starting with building this uh, DPO network, we started back in 2014. Uh, why 2014? Because it is when we finally updated our law uh, in France in order to make it compliant with the European directive. So you see, it's uh, a long time ago. Um, Marius, do, do you have slides to, my slides to push? Uh, dear Pascal, you have the control, you have two arrows at the bottom of the, the PowerPoint. Um, okay, sorry, I thought you were the one pushing the slides. I'm sorry because I had a, a problem with computer. My computer did not uh did not allow me to enter your um if you want i i, I can make the yes if you could use it because otherwise okay. i have to transfer the slides to this computer i had to to change my computer at last minute. thank you so much i oh, really appreciate you. so uh so now uh, you're going to be my uh, my co-pilot okay so, uh, so if you could move to the slides which shows the key dates for being, voilà, merci, there's this one. And uh, so, so, so starting in 20, uh, 2004, uh, we, we changed this law uh, in, in France, so that's a while back, uh, and in order to adapt it to the European directive. And that's when we introduced this optional function of correspondant à la protection des données, so data protection correspondent, that was the, the beginning of the DPO, but it was totally optional. And at this time, a few people thought, well, this is the beginning of a profession. And uh, we gathered people in a room. There were like between 50 and 100 people. And in an event, totally, you know, uh, not improvised, but, you know, in order to think, well, do you think there is a need for an association? And there people, said yes and that's how ifcdp started and little by little the association built up and got more structured with the idea that people are all volunteers and here to share their knowledge because the profession was building up little by little so really it the idea is to connect build on a friendly uh, basis and relationship so we had this construction little by little and one of the landmark date was of course the creation of CEDPO in CEDPO in 2011 when 
you know, we saw that there was something cooking at the European level, and we understood that there was a need to promote and defend the role of the DPO in GDPR so that it had the right place in the construction of data protection. So that's how we gathered other associations in order to be present and facing European institutions. So, uh, and, and you've got all these associations with you today, so that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and because everybody is still convinced about, about this role. Uh, so little by little, we've built and uh, made the, the association more robust. We have uh, indeed, in order to be able to have more uh, active and concrete actions, we had to build a staff, a concrete staff. And now we have four permanent members with us who help with uh, registrations, who help with organizing our groups, who help with our day-to-day -day activities. So, this has been also since 2014, really uh, an important change in the way we work. We have also, so there is a big echo, which I cannot explain. Perhaps, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, um, so in 2018, really, uh, we realized that there was a need for us to be more influential, be more influential uh, especially with the uh, French Parliament, with uh, other bodies in France. We always had a very strong relationship with the CNIL, but we strengthened that. So we've been pushing that a uh, little bit more and we've been building our external image. So slowly you see our association has been evolving. Next slide. So we have 1,870 members, uh, more or less. The way uh, our membership is built is that most of the members are legal entities. So legal entities and each of them have five or more individuals who can join or discussions or networking capabilities. So that makes it about 6,000 people who coordinate on a regular basis and exchange on a regular basis. And as you can see, we have doubled the number of individuals who exchange since 2017. So big increase as soon as we saw that GDPR was arriving. Next slide. We realized, you know, after a while that uh, like, everybody uh, in France that uh, the thing is everything was happening in Paris and that's a problem in France you know uh, Paris seems to be like the center of the world but uh, we have uh, government uh, bodies government bodies outside of Paris we have uh, business organizations outside of Paris and we wanted them also to benefit from these networking capabilities so little by little we found volunteers in several regions and even outside of uh, what we call the metropole so mainland uh, so even in islands like la reunion or martinique we have volunteers who animate our groups regional groups in order to make you know the reflection uh, happen so we've got now 15 regional groups And so we have three types of working groups. So I mentioned the regional groups so that people can exchange about what's happening in their region and make uh, their thoughts evolve. But we also have thematic groups. So either on punctual topics like COVID-19 was a big topic with, of exchange lately, but we have a group on the right of access. You know, how do you deal with access requests? It's, an, uh, it's a topic which never ends. Uh, we have a group of people who wanted to exchange on how to raise awareness internally. A very important group on health data. We have another group on customer relationship management, which has evolved towards addressing the topic of cookies and trackers. Uh, and also we have sectorial groups. So sectors of activities like insurance or NGOs or social housing want to meet and discuss about 
what is happening in their uh, sector of activity. So that's about 70 meetings, you know, among all these working groups, some of them also organizing specific dedicated events. Uh, so 70 meetings, which took place in 2019. Of course, it's been a bit impacted in 2020, but we are getting organized uh, in order to uh, do that uh, more remotely uh, with new means uh, now. So how do we bring value to our members? We've developed several tools for that. The, the center of our exchanges takes place on a, an internet tool, uh, which is called our Agora. It is a social network where uh, we provide information to our members. So it's organized either by groups, topical groups for specific topics, or a very important function is the function which we call help. So any person can ask a question. We encourage people to ask even stupid questions because we often have new members who don't know anything about data protection or they're just beginners, they start. So they can ask any new question. It's not moderated because we want people to answer freely. And then other members help answering the question. The only moderation we do is that we've got our permanent staff who verifies whether this, the question has not been already answered previously, in which case we link the question to previous answers. And then this way, you know, members help other members on uh, questions, either easy or more complex. They provide their thoughts. Sometimes the answer may be accurate, sometimes it may not be accurate, but you know, what is an accurate answer on data protection? Very often there is no accurate answer. There are two or three possible answers, depending on the circumstances, and that's how the debate is happening on this Agora. We also provide awareness raising tools, uh, like these little uh, cartoons, uh, which are, uh, our members can use internally or externally. Uh, they are available in French and in English. And here it's to, this one is to raise awareness on the new responsibility of the data processor uh, in the framework of GDPR. So we've got cartoons on every GDPR uh, topic. We've also developed a DPO ethics charter which can help the DPO in the DPO uh, in the data controller or the data processor organization to get his role more recognized because that puts in place the rights and obligations of the DPO and of the data controller so it can be co-signed and um, this document it's not just an IFCDP document. It's not just for our organization. It's available in French. It's available in English. So if any of you want to reuse it, you know, take it. It's free. It's no, no problem. And we've developed and we're developing again and again new services. We've organized a survey of satisfaction of our members. Uh, with a professional organization lately in order to see what other new services we could be providing to them. One of the services we provide is a job board. So we send them regular messages about uh, new jobs which are being offered on the markets and which relate to DPO or, and when I say DPO, it's in a broad sense, huh? any job related to data protection. It can be a lawyer job on data protection. It can be a, a cybersecurity job with data protection uh, related functions. So if we spot that, we advertise it to our network so that they can find it easily. Uh, we also have a marketplace. If uh, an organization is looking for a professional, this organization can say, well, here is what I'm looking for. I need a professional to do this kind of job. And then the professionals who are members of our organization can say, well, yes, I can do this. Here, here is what I'm able to do. 
uh, here is my expertise, and so they can submit their, their, their proposals. And we've got also an annotated GDPR uh, document. We've published books on the DPO, and we've also made a link with uh, an insurance company so that our external DPOs can have a specific uh, insurance you know, for, for their job liability. So it's not an AFCDP one, it's provided by a third party, but it's what we are, you know, we facilitated the creation of this insurance. So I mentioned to you our collaboration with the CNIL. The CNIL is a French Data Protection Authority. We have regular meetings with them because they have a, a service dedicated to the DPOs. So we gather questions from our members and we bring them to the CNIL in order to facilitate answers back from the CNIL. And we've been one of the key stakeholders, you know, dialoguing with the French Parliament uh, in order to uh, make sure that uh, the right provisions were inserted in the French data protection bills, which implemented the GDPR. So we are acting also on the lobbying front. And I mentioned to you our annual event, which took place uh, last year. Uh, well, it took place last year, but it took place also this, this week. It's been the 15th edition. So every year we get uh, an intervention from the French Data Protection Authority and from, uh, from specialists. Uh, this year, uh, it's a special format uh, and we, we will uh, have broadcasted events all around the year in addition to, to this week. So, I'm sure you want to hear about enforcement of GDPR in France because that's uh, the crispy part and, and there are interesting lessons uh, to learn uh, from that. Uh, you know, because enforcement in France is, uh, or in any of our country, can have an impact on enforcement uh, in, uh, in other countries because of one-stop shop. So, uh, what has been the CNIL, our Data Protection Authority, activity uh, in 2019? Like other uh, authorities, they release an annual report. And what we learned from this annual report is that they received 14,000 complaints, so that's quite a high number, and they try to address all of them, but they don't manage always. They've also received 2,287 notification of personal data breaches. What we notice is that France is now the country where organizations notify the most data breaches. Really, the UK, the Netherlands, Germany are the countries where they are the most the highest numbers of notification of data breaches. So these European authorities have to try to understand why perhaps, uh, you know, we need more guidance. And now we know that we have the EDPB guidance, which may help us understand better when we have to notify data breaches. We have 65,000 DPOs uh, or organizations who have appointed DPOs now. So uh, a large number but still probably not enough in light of uh, the organizations. And um, we have a data protection authorities which organizes investigations, inspections. It used to do 200 a year and it has reached 300 this year. So, well, in, in 2019. So 300, the way it does it is that either it goes on site or it does it online and more and more online remotely is more easy or it requires companies it sends a letter and it requires companies to send back written documentation to demonstrate compliance so that's the way it works and in 41 percent of cases the inspections are initiated after complaints of individuals that's why it's very important when you get a complaint to close it directly uh, with the individual quickly you know, before it goes to the data protection authority uh, not so many sanctions uh, we heard uh, that they want to issue more sanctions uh, next year uh, eight sanctions in total uh, with seven fines 
altogether, but altogether that uh, amounts to 51 million uh, euros. And they can also issue injunctions, so injunctions to stop uh, to stop uh, infringing uh, the law. So they've issued, released five injunctions, uh, which are subject to financial penalty if you don't comply with the injunction. So that's the landscape, but I would like to describe to you three important enforcement actions which took place uh, last year, at the end of the year, against Google, Amazon and Carrefour. Next slide. So first, against Google. Two entities of Google have been sanctioned. That's Google Ireland, but also Google uh, LLC. Uh, were respectively fine uh, about their uh, approach to, go to cookies. Uh, they were sanctioned because basically when you accessed the google.fr website, the cookies were automatically installed on your computer and without any action from the user. And so lack of consent was a problem. And also there was no information by the search engine users, also of the search engine users. They didn't know what type of cookie would be uh, installed. There was just a, a prompt of the privacy policy of Google and, uh, and that was it, but uh, that was considered as not sufficient uh, information. And in addition, for those who finally understood how to adjust the cookies and to disconnect customized uh, advertising cookies, you know, well, the function didn't really work. It worked for some of the cookies, but still some cookies were finally installed on uh, the device of the user. So there was a partial failure to comply with the right to object. So that explains the sanctions and the sanctions actually were very high because of the large scale impact of the Google search engine, you know, uh, almost 50 million of users and also the huge amount of profits generated by Google advertising activity. So, and in addition, Google had indicated that they were updating their information banner, but still uh, after that, the CNIL found that the user didn't really have a clear understanding of the purpose of the cookies and they were not clearly informed of their right of, to object. So the modifications done by Google were not considered as sufficient. So that was taken into consideration in, uh, in the decision of sanction. Second very large sanction was against Amazon. So, of course, you all know Amazon uh, and uh, again, it was in relation to cookies. The cookies were also automatically placed on the computers of users without their consent and the information which was provided to them was insufficient. Insufficient because um, the banner basically stated that by using the website, they automatically accepted the use of cookies. So this banner was not sufficient. It did not allow the users to understand what type of cookies was placed and to, uh, to clearly object. So here again, non-compliance, not with GDPR, huh? let's be clear, but with the e-privacy uh, directive, which is implemented uh, in France in the French data protection law. So that's why the CNIL considered it was competent to, to, to address that. And uh, the CNIL took into consideration the fact that this Amazon cooking, cookie practice had taken place for a long time and that the site was really popular, that millions of people were using Amazon. So that's why the, 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 the fine is a sizable uh, fine. Uh, it's um, Amazon Europe Core SARL, uh, which was fined here. Then a very, very interesting sanction, because it covered 
several violations and we can derive many learnings from it. It's the sanction against the Carrefour Group. Here, it addressed two companies of the Carrefour Group, uh, Carrefour Bank, uh, and so the bank side of the group, and Carrefour France. Uh, so these two companies were respectively fined 2.2 million euros and 800,000 uh, euros for different violations. So I'm not going to detail uh, respectively which ones, but uh, to be, tell you what was important. Carrefour France was running a loyalty program. And under this loyalty program, they were not with, uh, considered as compliant with the data retention uh, limitation requirements. Why is that? Because they were keeping 28 million, the data of 28 million customers who were still inactive. They had been inactive for five to 10 years. So, and they were still maintaining their loyalty program. And here's a clear state, well, stated, well, you know, if you have inactive customers, you know, you can keep them for three years, no more after the last activity. After that, you have to delete them. So very interesting takeaway here uh, about storage limitation. Then other interesting lessons about individual rights requests. Here, Carrefour France was systematically asking for a copy of an ID when individuals were exercising their rights. And Tukneel said, well, this is excessive. You know, you can ask for an ID only if you have a doubt about the identity of a person. Otherwise, you don't ask. Then the company was keeping the copy of the ID for a period to one to six years. Here, the client said, no, you retain the ID for the time necessary to verify the identity of the requester. Once you've checked, you've done the check, you delete. So uh, another important uh, lesson. And there were many complaints, and of course these complaints led to this investigation and this, uh, this sanction, because the companies, they had ignored access requests and also requests from individuals to uh, object to the sending of text messages and the sending of email marketing messages. So that explains the sanction. Then, Another uh, reason for the sanction is uh, in relation to transparency. That's, um, and that's where it's getting tricky. It's going to get tricky for us as professionals, but it's something which the CNIL has been repeating a lot. It reviewed the notice provided by Carrefour and it said, no, well, first it's not accessible easily. It's fragmenting along, uh, several, among several documents. So it has to be available more easily to the, your users. They should not go one document to one document, one document. Then the content is not clear. It's vague, it's broad. You cannot use terms like these processing activities include without limitation. Your data may be used, certain data certain data about you are used to do this. These terms are too vague. The CNIL wants clear information. Say exactly what you do, not, not try to cover what you may do in the future. If you may, if you change, then you change your privacy notice. This is not easy, yeah. Huh? Uh, we, we're facing big challenges here when we draft our privacy notices. So, uh, and the last but not least, again, cookies. They were caught on their cookie practices because cookies were automatically set on the carrefour.fr and carrefourbank.fr uh, websites without any action from the users to accept them. So, I'm not going to spend time on um, on the, the sanction and the reason for the sanction, also it's very interesting, this reasoning. Uh, but what I want to highlight here 
um, is that the CNIL is strengthening its muscles. Cookies are in its radar. Uh, the CNIL wants to show not only to French companies, but to the rest of the world that um, it has enforcement capabilities and uh, that it's using them. Uh, it has issued guidelines on cookies. It is actually adapting these guidelines in order to make them more clear on a few topics like uh, audience measuring uh, cookies. Uh, but it has set a deadline, which is April 1st, for all companies to implement the cookies. And so, uh, you know, companies have to, you know, uh, address these guidelines if they don't want to be caught here. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Pascal, I have a question for you uh, because uh, you mentioned uh, the fact that there were uh, fines uh, in uh, some of 51 million euros, but adding the Carrefour fine to the Google fine, uh, actually it's more than 51 million. Is the Carrefour fine definitive or have they uh, gone to court to uh, try to make it smaller or? Yes, the, the fines I mentioned are were for 2019, so okay. not, not for 2020. I don't have the final figures for 2020. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you, and also I would like to thank you again for being here and uh, to mention how proud uh, our uh, association is for, for being part of such a greater one. Thank you, Christiane. Mascal, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for your presentation.